Dustin. Um, Stephen, would you do the intro and, and uh, kick this off, please? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're our first technical presentation is going to be from uh, Dr. Austin Hapel. He is a research biologist with the Shedd Aquarium. And backing him up, we have um, uh, Dustin Gallagher, who is an aquatic biologist with MWRD. And they're going to be talking about the trends in fish populations in the uh, Chicago waterways area and the research techniques that they've been using to track this. Obviously, this is a item very close to the DRSEW's heart, and this research seemed to fit in really well with what we were what we're working on, so we thought it was interesting to compare notes and get a, get a shot in the arm for some good news about how aquatic communities can recover um, when, uh, when we get make good decisions. So with that, I'm going to, we're gonna hand over to Austin. He's gonna take over, uh, he's gonna show his screen so he can run us through some maps, graphs, and all that good stuff. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna jump over to sharing screen. So that should be working now. Um, so, hi everyone. If you don't uh, know me, I feel like I've met a handful of people that are probably here. Um, I'm a research biologist with the Shedd Aquarium. Um, I've only been around for about a year and a half at Shedd, um, but since then I've made some close connections with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago um, to look at some of the data that they collect. And Dustin, Gallagher is here, um, one of their associate biologists, um, at least uh, to help answer questions if you have questions that pertain to some of the work that they do. Because um, I really was just handed a bunch of Excel files and turned it into a story. So <laughs> Dustin can answer some of the other questions people have. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the changes to the fish assemblage we've seen in Chicago over the past um, three decades or so. Um, the image that's on there really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the talk. It's actually me going out and looking for larval fish in downtown Chicago. Um, it's just a good um, image for the moment. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. So I don't want to spend too much time on background of the waterways because I think you guys are pretty well acquainted to what we've done and what's happened, but it still helps with some stage setting for the general story. Um, Chicago was built around the Chicago River here. Um, at the time, it flowed out into Lake Michigan. Um, the city expanded down over to the Calumet Rivers, which also flowed out into Lake Michigan, and then headed west towards the Des Plaines, which flowed out towards the Mississippi. And at the time, we could use these rivers for drinking water and as sewage water, um, sewage transportation. And then we started pulling water in for drinking water from Lake Michigan. But with the growing populations and water flowing towards our water intake cribs, um, created sort of a drinking water hazard um, if sewage water is flowing out towards where you're getting drinking water. So we worked to reverse them. So. Um, pretty much an engineering marvel to build multiple miles of canals to reverse an entire river system and send all of our waste downstate. Um, <clears throat> so we were able to do that and kind of save our water intake cribs and drinking water sources. Um, now the system stands as a mostly man-made waterway. Um, the water levels are controlled by three or so locks and dams. And, um, Again, uh, they tend to be working waterways now. So a lot of barges and a lot of um, boat traffic flying up and down them. Um, and a lot of cities were kind of built in similar ways using rivers to um, their advantage and often to the detriment of fish communities within them. Um, Chicago's area waterways um, are strictly or very closely tied to our sewer system. Um, right now, the system has somewhere around 370 combined sewer overflows, uh, which um, is one of the first sewer systems to take sewers from street level to underground. Um, it combined our waste from our houses with stormwater, um, and then when it rains heavily, that would flow out into rivers to help um, keep our wastewater treatment plants working properly. Um, so these waterways not only are working waterways, but they're tied to our stormwater and sewer system. 
MWRD is trying to um, untangle those systems. So if you've heard of the tunnel and reservoir program, um, working to build some deep tunnels and deep reservoirs to store the combined um, stormwater and sewage water. Um, that way it can all be treated and sent to a treatment facility before it gets to the river. Um, that way we can reduce the times that untreated sewage water is entering these waterways. <clears throat> so a large portion of the system is already running. Um, some of the tunnels came online in 2006 and the areas that did go online cut CSO events in half, if not cut further. Um, and some of the reservoirs are already completed. So two reservoirs are fully completed. Um, those nearly eliminated the CSO events in those areas and they're still working on um, completing other parts of the system. In total, it's uh, projected to hold somewhere around 17 billion gallons of water, which is a um, gigantic large amount of water. Um, and hopefully when all of it's completed, it will kind of eliminate um, the tie-in from the sewer and stormwater to our actual um, river ecosystem here. So these are, um, I guess great public works projects that are trying to clean up the waterway. Uh, we still do some really weird things to the Chicago River. Um, I like to point out that each year to raise money for the Special Olympics, we tend to dump thousands and thousands of rubber ducks into the system. Um, great fundraiser, maybe not a great message to be sending people who are actively dumping rubber trash into the system. Uh, we also, nearly annually uh, dump in enough food grade dye to turn the river green. And while it's claimed to be non-toxic, um, I haven't really found any studies that prove that. Uh, <laughs> but what image does this really send people when we're dumping things actively into our river system? Um, how do you talk to people about uh, reducing waste and treating the river better when we're actively promoting the dumping of items into it? Um, and none of this talking up to this point makes you want to do this, right? So most people don't think of the river as a recreational asset and that at one point in time, we should be able to swim in it, if not fish out of it. Um, it should be something we can enjoy and we'll continue kind of working towards that. But if you do Google for uh, fishing in downtown Chicago, you'll find images. So there is a diverse fishery um, within the area and people are really interested in fishing um, in downtown. Um, and how great would it be if we were able to promote Chicago as a recreational fishing destination uh, while being downtown? It would be pretty awesome and I'm hoping that we could work towards um, talking about that. And so one of the things I was interested in is looking at how can we start talking about the fishery and the fish assemblage in Chicago. Um, and the easiest thing to do is to start picking at large data sets. So the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District um, started monitoring and sampling fish back in 1974. Um, that was somewhat sporadic and they started uh, an annual program in 1985 um, and that's been going on um, since then. Initially they used AC electrofishing, they switched to DC electrofishing in 2001 and continue to use that now. Um, they tend to go for uh, distance, so they'll go for about 400 feet sections of river. Um, and so out of this large data set, I actually pared it down quite a bit. So they sample throughout the waterway. Um, each year, they might sample different locations, but I was able to find nine sites that they sampled almost every year since that 1985 start date. Um, so those nine sites are on the map here, and then they're color coded and use symbols where I kind of lump them into waterways due to how close they are to each other. Up on the north side, there's three sites that I just called the North Shore Channel. Um, right in the center of downtown, there's two sites that I call the Sanitarium Ship Canal. And then there's four other ones that are just single site locations that uh, we'll be looking at going forward. Um, starting at the right, the Calumet River, then the Little, little Calumet River, the Cal Sag, then all the way at the bottom, the Lockport Lock and Dam. 
Um, so these were most consistently sampled over those uh, three decades. And then I further um, cut out samples that didn't occur in July, August, and September. So we'll only um, I use that to kind of reduce some of the variation. So now we're talking about July, August, September fish community at these nine sites, um, cutting out variation with uh, seasons and habitat changes and things. So this might end up looking like data that a lot of you are kind of working with, um, where it's species by count and then there's like a date and a location and things. So um, Stephen suggested I maybe talk a little bit about what we did. Usually I skip through a lot of this stuff because the general public doesn't care. Um, though I removed species that were no longer in this data set um, since I did some of those um, data cutting and making sub data sets. We had a bunch of hybrid sunfish. I just grouped them all together into one group. Um, I think there was almost 10 or 11 different hybrids and I just called them all hybrid sunfish. Um, and I kept all the data as counts. Um, and so we ended up with about 58 species. Typically people will go for some sort of distance-based analysis. So you might've heard of permutational ANOVA or permanova. Um, non-metric multidimensional scaling plots or analysis of similarity, um, some other distance-based analyses. And these often give you pretty low power and it's really hard to um, get effect sizes. So it's hard to say like, this is X amount different from that site due to this species. Um, and it's really hard to make predictions. So if you wanted to go back and be like, what does this site look like um, at this stage if I sampled three times as much or something. And what's most annoying is you tend to lose species specific data. So you wouldn't be able to look at how did largemouth bass differ between these locations over the years. Um, so I jumped over to some modeling approaches. Um, traditional sort of univariate modeling things, you can just use a linear model or um, for these count data, you'll often hear people talk about Poisson modeling or not negative binomial or zero inflated models. What's nice about these is I can kind of get back to those um, pitfalls of the distance-based analyses is that they tend to have pretty high power because we can model how does the mean and variance look like for each species. Um, recently with the increase in program R, uh, people are using resampling procedures to make these multivariate. Um, and that way they work just like Permanova and Anosim, but they have the power of these modeling approaches and let me make predictions. Um, so to give you a, a short look of essentially what we did, is I used negative binomial regressions. So these are really good for counts, especially when abundance is really variable. Um, these are an extension of Poisson regression if you're used to that, but they have a, uh, dispersion estimator, so they can help us work with that extremely variable um, counts. Um, and the output of it is pretty similar to log transforming your count. So it, if you were to just do a um, running regression with log transform counts, it's pretty similar. Um, this is an actual call that we used in R. Um, so it's just a generalized linear model. Uh, that's a negative binomial. Um, in this example, my uh, dependent variable is native species count. Our predictors were gear types. Since we used two different gear types, the AC and DC electrofishing, we had a bunch of years and then different waterways, and then an offset to help sample or help account for the time differences, because sometimes they may be only sampled for five minutes and other times half an hour. <laughs> and then, of course, with R, people build all sorts of nice stuff, and I don't have to worry about trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, they have a program called MV Abund, which will do the resampling for me. And what it does is it allows me to fit those negative binomial models to every species, and then it resamples across gears, across years, across waterways to give me um, significance of each of those predictors. Um, and so that's pretty nice and pretty easy to use. Um, and I didn't have to figure out how to do the resampling and things. Um, if you're interested in it, I recommend looking up um, 
the word MVA bund on YouTube, there's like a 10 minute video explanation that helps give more background to it. So to show quickly what the top groups of species look like, um, the data set in total had some 450 sampling events, over 50,000 species or individual fish being caught. Um, this is just a list of species from most abundant running down and then I just cut it off once we got towards 300. So there's a large number of species on here. Um, at the top, you'll see we tried to lump in a tolerance to pollution metric. We put in native and invasive species just to kind of look at changes in those. Years found, just to give an idea of how frequently these are located. Um, and then I have numbers separated by whether it was AC fishing, so before 2000, or DC fishing from 2001 onward. And just with data like this, we can look at, there's a lot of species that have increased in numbers over those years. Most of those are native species. Um, we can point out species that have decreased. So a lot of these are things like goldfish and fathead minnows and um, goldfish carp hybrids. Um, and we can see that there's species that were found with one type of gear and not the other type of gear, so leading more evidence to the fact that different types of electrofishing catch different things. Um, and so those are kind of cursory looks at the data set. These are the actual graphs that are in um, the paper that we were that we published out of this. So on the left, there's native species richness. So just the count of different species that are found and how that's changed over the years. Um, and on the right is the invasive species counts. Um, and the lines are the actual predicted values out of those um, models. And then each of the points is the actual mean for that year for each waterway. So on this left graph, you can see a bunch of purple diamonds. That's the mean from whatever number of samples they had for that year for Little Calumet River, which actually has a pretty high uh, native species richness compared to the others. And we can see that they're increasing. The native species richness went from like under five back in the 80s to now somewhere around 15, depending on where they are and um, when they're sampling. And then invasive species richness didn't really seem to change much. Um, rather uh, flatlined somewhere around three, one to three invasive species, and those are usually carp, goldfish, um, some around goby. The other thing um, I really like to talk about outside of richness is just the catch per unit effort that they saw increase. So Early in the 80s, they caught somewhere around 50 for the same amount of effort, which is about 30 minutes of electrofishing. Um, and now they catch somewhere over 300 individual fish. Um, so that's a huge increase going from 50 to 300 in just three decades. Um, and then invasive fish is, the trends are kind of all over the place and overall just no general trend in the catch per unit effort for those. Um, and again, that model let me pull out individual fish differences. So what happened with um, each species, which ones changed significantly. And so we have some graphs in the paper on each individual fish and what happened with them. Um, so just to quick fly through some of those. Um, gizzard shad, we saw huge increases in the early years and then kind of a leveling off lately. So in the 2000s, not much of a change. blood nose minnow, um, not much of a change in the early years and an increase um, now in the 2000s. And these are all presented on a um, logistics scale. So just a slight increase in that line or decrease in that line is actually quite a large number of changes. Um, and then golden shiner, another important prey fish, increasing quite a bit. Some decreases, um, common carp. There was a decreasing trend, but it's mostly driven by Lockport sampling site, which is really kind of interesting because a lot of the rest of the Mississippi River drainage is showing decreases in common carp catches. So it's interesting that our Lockport site is showing those decreases, but our other sites seem to be pretty stagnant and pretty level. Um, so why is the common carp population within Chicago doing pretty well, but once you get to Lockport and South, it's declining, um, is something I'm interested in kind of learning more about. 
some species we saw really big increases in were the banded killifish suddenly popping up and then exploding in population numbers. Um, so we first saw them at the Calumet River site in this data set and then kind of all over pretty quickly afterwards. Um, and then yellow bullhead really popped up when they changed gears and seemed to be increasing pretty quickly since then. I know there's a few times that they've been stocked. Um, we don't see a massive jump really related to those events um, outside of that jump in the changing gears. And the final spattering of graphs are sport fish. So increases in fish we'd like to talk to anglers about and try to get people interested in coming to Chicago to go fishing. Um, we saw increases in all four of these, the bluegill, the green sunfish, pumpkin seed, uh, representing some of the smaller panfish guys, and then largemouth bass increasing. Um, all of those seem to be more prevalent in the little Calumet River and Calumet River area, um, which is kind of cool. And that's also where we tend to see a lot of fishing tournaments. So not surprising that they're targeting that area. Another way to kind of look at this data is to pull out the predicted means um, for each species. So just to give you a different way of looking at things. I know I'm going through them really fast. I'm trying to point out some of the important things. And when I look at this, I see a lot of orange and a lot of purple. Um, and those represent the Calumet River and the Little Calumet River. So species seem to be more abundant in um, those two locations. Um, is generally what I pull out of this. Um, and that you can relate back to when I looked at the native species richness, the Calumet River and Little Calumet River had pretty high native species richness. And then that's showing up here as the predicted mean abundances for um, these species being pretty high in those areas. So enough graphs um, to talk a little bit about what some of it means and what I was kind of hoping to look at. Um, we saw very little changes in species that we would consider to be pollution sensitive. Um, some of those species like darters and sculpin we're just not going to see in the Chicago area waterways and um, they might not even catch them using an electrofishing boat. Um, the other thing I think about with looking at individual species and their sensitivity is that it's not really consistent how they're tested. Often someone will test one stressor in isolation. Um, and, or you can look at like, okay, there's five studies on creek tub, two of them say they're sensitive and three of them say they're insensitive. How do you take that information and um, collate it into something that makes sense? So we don't really see a whole lot of changes in those pollution sensitive species. And I'm not sure looking at individual species in that manner is going to tell us a whole lot. Um, but I do like talking about the changes in species richness. If we see numbers going from like three to now 15, that's a huge change in richness and has to at least speak to some changes in water quality and habitat availability. Um, and then you can add potency to that when it's native species richness that's changing, uh, not that you're dumping new invasives into an area. Um, the other thing we saw throughout um, the data set is that there's higher diversity over here in the Calumet area. So this is a map of, um, like you can see Lake Calumet here. Uh, the TJ O'Brien Lock and Dam, our Calumet River site, which was represented by the orange color, um, is actually outside of the Lock and Dam system. And so it's influenced by Lake Calumet and it's influenced by all these slips in the waterway leading up to Lake Michigan. Um, and so it's likely that this area had high diversity because there's a large diverse amount of habitat there. Fish can go between the lake and between um, the Calumet River there. Um, the second highest diversity was actually just downstream a few miles. Um, so we think that habitat diversity here is leading to why we saw so many changes in the fish community in that section. And then again, these are working waterways. They often have these corrugated steel. They often have flat bottoms without a whole lot of habitat. So although we've seen increases in the fish community so far, um, continued efforts in helping um, habitat-wise and water quality-wise would be 
um, appreciated and we'd have to be pretty creative. Uh, all, anything we do to help enhance habitat or enhance the food web will have a lot of barge traffic still um, and have to uh, subsist through wave action um, and that can be pretty challenging engineering wise. Um, if you've been to Chicago's Wild Mile Project, which is near Goose Island. Um, it's on the eastern side of Goose Island. There's a whole foods there. You can actually go behind it and peer over the side and these islands are what you'll see. Um, these are floating wetlands. They're coconut core mats that are planted with native wetland plants. Um, the idea is to provide a park that's pretty for people to look at, but also functional because um, those plants are pulling pollutants um, out of the water. Um, pulling nutrients out of the water and hopefully providing some habitat for fish to hide in and feed off of um, and spawn on. So I'm trying to work with the group putting in this project to look at if these islands are providing those benefits and how potent those benefits are. Um, and they represent one of um, a few pretty creative ways that we're trying to add habitat back to the system um, now that especially now that we're seeing these big changes in the fish communities. Um, so I tried to go through things somewhat quickly. It is a published paper um, that people can look up or we can share around, um, but I wanted to kind of go through it, um, give some people an idea of what we're seeing and how we looked at the data and then hopefully have some good discussion afterwards. So, um, Let's see what people have shared, if I can figure out how to look at questions and answers, or if someone else is moderating. Yeah, I can moderate too, and Stephen can. Um, so far, if you guys could use the question and answer for these questions, it'd be helpful for me to track them. Um, so far, we only have a comment in the chat, and uh, Garrett had said that he could fill the chat with tons of smallmouth and largemouth bass pictures from CalSag, Lake Cal, and the Calumet yeah. River. He's blown away with how year after year with the quality of fish and that he says it's a hidden gem fishery. <clears throat> yeah, it um, supports the most consistent um, bass tournaments that I can find in the area. And I need to get out there and start talking to the bass fishermen to see um, what they uh, see as what's happened over these years. Does it, um, relate to what we're seeing within the data set and then also like just get their knowledge of um, the habitat over there because I feel like bass fishermen are out all the time and so they see these changes and know a lot more than I do who <laughs> set a computer most of the time. Um, so so uh, Austin, um, how, how sensitive, just looking at the data set, how sensitive do you think the data set was to the change from um, DC to AC? Pretty sensitive. Um, yeah, it looked that way for some of the species, yeah. Yeah, uh, for some, that's the thing. For some of the species, you can see a big jump. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's up or down, uh, you can see a, a disjoint there. And then for some of the other species, you don't really see that, and that might be say like for gizzard shad, they might just be so variable that you don't see the mm -hmm. change. Um, but we know pretty well that changes in the type of electrofishing that you're doing and even some fine tuning of the electrofishing can change the size and type of fish that you're getting. Because um, you can change the settings to target catfish if yep. you really needed to or sturgeon or something at the bottom. Um, usually we don't use those settings. <laughs> but there's, it might be, I've been interested in diving more because there's so much data in that set, diving more into it to try to see like, can we pull out specifically how that gear shift changed, not only the species we caught, but the size within species. Like, do we catch more super large bass now than we did before that switch? Yeah, okay. So yeah, has the, have the median size of the species that you're changed. attaching changed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, sorry, Dina. So we have two, we have a couple of questions come in. So 
Um, uh, Aaron was wondering, has any research been done into why fish are improving? Um, was it river cleanup or was it habitat restoration and creation? Any, has anyone done that work yet? Um, so like this was solely looking at the fish and what has changed um, with that fish community. I'm hoping that I can look at water quality and kind of link it in. So what water quality parameters are best predictors of this change we've already documented. Um, and then uh, I would be interested in looking at how fish communities are different, like above and below the wastewater treatment plants mm -hmm. and before and after habitat um, enhancement. But so far within the Chicago area, I don't know of much there. There's all sorts of other habitat um, enhancements or restoration projects that have been published, but not many on a waterway that's like this. So like we don't know what has uh, the most benefit. And, and as you were saying, the other thing is that we, there's a lot of variability in the uh, quantity of data av available for stressors by site. It's not necessarily uniform. Um, I guess maybe Dustin can talk about yeah. some of the water quality data that sure. you've been collecting. Sure. Yeah, I mean, this, this fishing, uh, is a basically it's an add-on to our water quality monitoring program um, i think these increases in species and uh, densities are are a result of our uh, efforts in water quality improvement in the system throughout the years um, where we go from here may you know may have to be have a large habitat component um, like he, like Austin has said, the Calumet system is uh, much further along. I think because we have a diverse amount, diverse uh, habitat types there. Uh, throughout most of the man-made system, it's it's generally like Austin said, it's uh, sheep piling. It's uh, there's no or very little litor number of littoral zones. Uh, these are all areas where fish rely on for various life stages. And uh, so if you want to further increase your species abundance and you know, densities, uh, we're probably looking at some inventive ways of in creating habitat in these man-made, uh, heavily trafficked waterways. Okay. We have a couple of questions sort of, um, kind of about the electric barrier. So were there any differences in invasive species quantity upstream and downstream of the electric barrier? I mean, do you guys have that data? The only, the, we have Lockport is, is the only station I think we discuss in this particular uh, paper, but that's generally the only station we uh, sample at that mm -hmm. would be below the barrier. Um, so, yeah. And then you know, I would think, oh, I was like, Asian carp are the main one I would think of that's going to be different in, um, or cause differences between upstream and downstream of the electric barrier, at least that we are aware of due to their <laughs> large population size downstream. Uh, and so yeah, there'd, there'd be an increase in those since they're downstream of the electric barrier, but um, I don't know a difference caused by another species, I guess. And then I guess this was a specific, specific question about the Asian, both the silver and the fathead um, carp. Have we found any upstream, the, uh, upstream of the barrier with this sampling? Not with this sampling, but uh, the uh, Asian carp monitoring crews through IDNR and in that in the Merwig, they have collected, I think, was it three since 2009, I want to say, but we have not collected uh, in this program any silver or big headed carp. We have collected grass carp, I 
think, but I think it was outside of this program. Okay, and then I have a question, sort of kind of back, backing off of what you were talking about, the urban nature of these watersheds with the sheep piles and things is, how much more improvement in the fish assemblies is there possible in the future? Like, is there a reasonable expectation for these waterways? I mean, obviously they're not natural streams, so how does, you know, where can we get to? Do you have any opinions on that? I mean, my goal, so I'm still working with um, some of, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what Patrick's <laughs> title is. I'm still working with MWRD on some of this data to kind of look at more in fish demographic information because I'm not sure we'd see drastic increases in some of the numbers that I've shown and I'm more interested now in looking at the quality of the fishing in the area. So even though we have largemouth bass, are those bass something that a fisherman would be happy catching or are they skinny and small? Um, and so that's more where I'm trying to focus now is what is what are the sizes of these individuals and what's the condition factor of them? Do we have a do we have something fishermen and anglers would be happy to go out and um, catch? And if we don't, what are some ways that we could help increase um, the condition factor of those fish? Um, do we need to add more habitat in so that they could, so that some of their prey items could spawn and they would have more food? Or do we need to add in um, habitat that's refuge from flows or boats or water quality issues? So those sort of questions are where I'm starting to lead rather than how do we add more species um, to this? Because I'm not sure there's a much other than like, if we could get pike in the area and spawning, that would be awesome, but. <laughs> That's Steven's favorite fish. So I always laugh when we, when we talk about the pike because we have pike on Salt Creek and he likes to always reinforce that with us. Make sure we've, we've collected a few northern pike in the uh, Calumet system, but not on a regular basis. Yeah. So I have one last question. So you guys, please go ahead and put your questions in. And this question, I think, more for either Stephen or I to answer, but that this was great and that um, this participant has listened to the webinar that we did on Salt Creek and was wondering if there's other studies on urban rivers, the displays and the DuPage system, because um, they are powerful drivers for support and continued improvements of the waterways. And so for, in terms of our work, the DRSCW itself, um, not only on Salt Creek, but also does sampling on the East Branch and the West Branch DuPage River. And we have a sister coalition on the Lower DuPage, the Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition that is also doing a sampling. And I think between those two groups on the DuPage system in Salt Creek, we have about 200 sites where we're collecting data, 150 up here-ish, 40-ish down um, in the lower DuPage. And then just recently, um, the Conservation Foundation um, with Jennifer Hammer, who I believe is on the call, is staffing um, the lower displays watershed group, which is looking at sort of the displays river system from um, the O'Hare area all the way down to that Joliet area. And they are also collecting data um, both on the main stem as well as on the tributary streams. And then we have other sister organizations run out of Lake County that are looking at the upper displaying system, including the North Branch, Chicago River, and others. So this data, we have a very comprehensive data set for all of Northeastern Illinois when you look at the work that MWRD is doing in the cause and then that these individual work groups are doing across um, the area. These are all paired studies. We are looking at both habitat, biology, both the fish and the bugs, as well as water chemistry. Steven, do you wanna to add to that? I mean, that's just sort of a summary of all. So we yeah. are looking at really this broad data set across these urban streams in Northeastern Illinois. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, the, the data there, it, we haven't looked at it sort of in the, the, um, the very long-term trend way that uh, Austin and Dustin has, or the data set's not quite so, I hadn't got such a long tail, but it, it, it shows a, right. Um, we did manage to get some data from the early 1990s that we were able to, it was co collected using very similar techniques. And we felt it was comparable. 
and it shows a very large increase in num both numbers and species diversity since that period. So, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, it matches what Austin was showing, uh, which is that, um, you know, the, our improvements in water chemistry, largely borne by wastewater treatment facilities, but increasingly also by stormwater controls, is, is definitely, uh, has improved um, our fish communities. Um, you know, and then of course the question becomes, you know, how do we be smarter about this in the next, uh, the next decade or so? That is all the questions that I have so far, unless anybody has any last minute questions. So I, I guess I would ask if Austin or Dustin had any like uh, short takeaways um, for things for us to think about as we're all working on trying to uh, get these fish communities um, pushed as high as we can in urban waterways. Any jams? <laughs> Well, I mean, we're always looking for what has created the most like potent change, right? And if you we're seeing changes in the fish community, that means something's caused that food web to change. Because um, fish being a higher vertebrate, they have to eat lower things for those to survive. Um, so if you guys have like before and after da data of like, when a policy action was enacted or a restoration thing happened, those are great stories to talk to people about, and, um, especially if they show big increases like we're seeing here. Um, I'm hoping that I could start going back and pinpointing like, okay, here's when disinfection happened. What was the change that we saw after that? And here's when chlorination stopped. When, what was that change? But um, I'd say if you guys have targeted efforts towards that, that those are awesome stories to talk about and push. Yeah, the, the, the two that we have, or, or the data that we have is, is typically towards either a improvement of um, habitat, which you measure with QHEI, or a barrier removal. Um, so we've had successes with both of those, um, but often, like a couple of examples, you know, where we're looking at barrier removal, which we've done, but it's impinged by another barrier downstream. So what we've seen in a lot of cases is we can get the benthic community to respond, but the fish community remains. We do see changes in the fish community. Like you were talking earlier about, you know, it's not just about your species and numbers. It's also about the, you know, the, the, the age structure of the community that you're finding. And certainly at some of our restoration sites, we have noticed improvements in that. Um, so there, you know, we're, we're working towards permit, um, uh, you know, you know, hitting permit goals. So we're looking to push, push our IBIs up, but, um, uh, so, you know, it may not make such a big difference there, but you can see in a, that there has been an improvement in the, in the fish community, but the, um, uh, you know, the, these, the barriers are the big thing with the fish community in, in our area. You know, it's just like you can, you, we can improve water quality. We can improve, um, in-stream habitat. But if the fish species are essentially, you know, they're not going to just suddenly evolve in the river because the everything's there for them. Not like the the insects can do that, as it as it were. <laughs> but um, so that that is our 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 biggest impingement. So some of the habitat improvements for fish, I think, are, uh, you know, we're still testing those because we have to resolve a couple of barrier issues before we can verify that those species are taking up residence where where we think that they would. All right. Well, if it, Dina, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to thank Austin and Dustin for their time and hard work on this. Uh, so thanks both of you. I feel welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting if you'd like to hear the other things we're working on. Otherwise, uh, you know, Austin, you and I should chat at some point about, uh, uh, you know, sharing information and um, uh, trying to uh, push the light of knowledge into these dark corners of urban, urban streams. <laughs> Yeah, what a it's a fun story in uh, COVID times. So it's uh, <laughs> nice to, uh, nice to talk about something positive. How yeah. all see sure. throughout these throughout our work. So um, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Austin. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. All right, our next presentation, uh, Stephen. You, you could yeah, Peter.
So we have Peter Gray with Aileron Communications. As we know, those are our uh, consultant who are working with us on outreach over our proposal for the master plan at uh, Salt Creek. And he is going to talk about the um, feedback that we got following our two open houses. Um, well, it seems like a long time ago already we were, were doing those, um, but it was, it was uh, only in July. And um, period, the uh, comment period closed on that, and he is going to take us through what the feedback has been to that information. Morning, Peter. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Um, yeah, we have a, really some other good news here, which is nice. Um, Dina, if you want to set me up, or maybe I already am, so I can share a screen. Yes, and I'm not. I'm. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Okay. I just have to figure out how to do that. Um, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so we had started the... It's not uh, coming up. We're not, we're not seeing your screen yet. That, that's okay. Just okay. take time. You know, it's always the uh, problem being the second speaker is you don't get the... You have to do this and with <laughs> everyone watching. Yeah. Um, if you... Let's see. If you move anyway, your curtain the, on the screen... It should pop up the little strip along the bottom of your screen will pop mm -hmm. up. There's a little green box that says share screen. Yeah, yes. I don't have one of those. Oh, Dina, I, you... I've got it now. I've got it now. All right. We're in, we're in good shape here. That's it. Now we got it. All right. Thanks for that. And Give it a run. Okay, everybody see the slides now? Yeah, Pete, could you go to full screen? There we go, that's it, scene. Yes, we're getting there. Okay, so um, the public engagement process, as folks are probably aware, there was uh, a fair amount of interest around the Fullersburg Woods project and the dam at Gribe Mill. So I've been working with Dina and Steven and the work group to do sort of public engagement and outreach work Starting back um, in 2018, late 2018, we started a uh, research process to do public opinion surveys around the dam and ideas around dam modification. Um, so the next phase we worked on here was actually public engagement around the master plan that um, was presented starting uh, early July. And basically our goals on this were Number one, awareness to make sure the public was aware that this was happening. Um, education to make sure folks understood the need for stream restoration and dam removal um, and the benefits that it would bring. And then engagement, so to get public feedback on the plan um, and to get public opinion data. Um, there were, you know, there were definitely some folks who were opposed to it and have been opposed to it for years. The question was always, is that representative of a majority of the public opinion in the area or not. Um, so we worked to really make sure that there was a broad awareness of this and a lot of folks were had the opportunity to weigh in. Um, and the results turned out pretty positive for the project. So we, and I think Dina and Stephen have been keeping folks apprised of this, this whole process. So um, on the awareness piece, which was first, we reached out to local media to get some press coverage on the topic. Um, we put out a public notice in the Daily Herald. They worked through social media campaigns to make sure folks saw it. Emails were sent out letting people know that um, the public engagement process was starting. There would be open houses where people could weigh in. Um, and there were newsletters through the Conservation Foundation and others that let people know about it. Uh, the education side was the RestoreSaltCreek.org website, which is a great clearinghouse for all the background information on the project. Um, Stephen and other work group members created videos explaining why that this project would be important and why it would be successful, similar to other projects that have been done in the area. Uh, they created fact sheets um, answering a lot of questions about what was going to happen and then held stakeholder meetings with uh, interested groups in advance of the public open houses to just get one-on-one -on -one feedback and questions. So then the, the real public engagement began with virtual open houses. These would have been 
just in-person open houses were it not for the pandemic, but um, held via Zoom kind of like this as a webinar where folks could answer questions um, and watch the full sort of explanation of this and, and answer their questions live. Um, there, there was follow-up with stakeholders after that, and then the thing we're going to discuss today was the public comment, which was done via a web form. It was open for 30 days. This is typical for public comment. And we had, that was kind of the official way to get data and responses on the reaction to this plan. Here's a quick timeline of all the activities that went into this um, starting around the beginning of June. Meetings, uh, when news stories ran, when the comment period opened, um, when the open houses were, and then through um, August 7th was the close of the public comment period. And so we held open house meetings. I've done, um, I've helped folks do a lot of different open house meetings, but these are my first virtual open houses. Um, and they went, I think, better than expected. We had 78 people attend the evening open house. That was the first one um, that lasted about 110 minutes. And then two days later, a daytime open house just to accommodate different schedules. That was uh, 71 people in attendance, uh, a few minutes shorter, but still over an hour and a half. Um, as I mentioned, it was a Zoom format. I served as the moderator. Stephen did the presentation and the Q&A. And then we made the recordings available online um, for folks that couldn't make the actual open houses. They could watch the video and get sort of the, the full information that folks who were there on the live webinar um, also received. So that was, you know, a little bit of an advantage over a live open house is if you couldn't make that specific time or you didn't have the travel availability, you could watch the webinar and still get, get informed about it um, and submit your comments at any point online afterwards. So the public comment, um, we use the, the standard 30 day period for collecting comments open to anyone at all. Um, we just requested that the folks watch the webinars and background videos. About three-fourths of the people uh, responded that they did watch that info, which is pretty good. And I guess um, nice honesty from the folks that didn't watch it. Um, and we just required name and address for folks that were submitting comments. So there were 173 responses, which is a, a pretty solid response from this. Um, and Bottom line was over 90% support. Um, so there were 86% of the people that responded said they strongly support the plan. 9% of the people said they oppose or strongly oppose it. And that support was consistent kind of across the board. We saw there weren't specific issues that people were concerned about. Really, the 90-10 the split was pretty consistent across all the questions we asked. Um, and we'll look at specific data on those in a minute. Um, we asked folks to not only answer, you know, multiple choice type questions on their public survey, but to just share their thoughts. Um, I put a few of those in here just so folks could get a flavor of the, the thoughts that came in. There were a lot of people that said, um, basically, this should have been done a while ago. Let's get it moving. Um, and several that commented that they, you know, they understand the the issues with it, and they think this is a good solution. So we were pleased to hear that. Um, there were comments in opposition to fewer than the supportive comments. Um, and again, these weren't generally; they were just that they didn't like the project. Um, there weren't specific issues usually mentioned about. I I understand what you're doing, but this particular section of it isn't going to work, uh, which is kind of what we were looking for to see if there were modifications needed that would either resolve public opposition or, you know, make the project better. We mostly got comments, you know, the, the vast majority were good job, go ahead. Um, and then a small fraction that were opposed pretty much in general. Um, there were a couple, I guess the two substantive comments we got were about main, maintaining water moving to uh, power the wheel, the mill wheel, which has always been a, a goal of the project if it's technically feasible. 
And then to um, keep the raceway, there was, I think, one or two comments about keeping this, the length of the raceway as long as they would be able to. As far as the folks who were commenting, um, spread out across the county, the vast majority of folks were from DuPage, which is the people we were targeting. Um, Elmhurst, Naperville, Downers Grove, Glen Ellen, Lyle, and Lombard were the top cities that responded. A few folks also weighed in from Cook County, and uh, four people were from out of state, but so they had just moved there and had been longtime residents. So um, I didn't list them on here, but I don't think they skewed the data too hard. So we'll look through the summary of the responses we got in the public comment form. So this was um, like a survey where you choose your answer on the majority of the questions and then open-ended on the comment portion. Um, and you'll see these are pie charts and they look similar. Um, I did not just copy and paste the pie chart, but they actually, uh, the data looks like this. Um, so the first question was, I understand the benefits of the master plan for Salt Creek at Fullersburg Woods. Um, most people understood a very, a very small portion, so they didn't understand. Um, the vast majority of people said that their questions were answered. Um, some said most of the questions. Most people said all their questions were answered. Um, and a few folks said they were not sure. So then the other question was just yes or no. Do you think the master plan will improve habitat? And you'll see the, that's the bottom left chart, uh, the blue being yes, the orange being no, it will not improve habitat. Will this improve recreation? Uh, again, yes and no, about 90% said yes. Um, and then the next question was about the legal requirements to improve water quality, which was a big part of what Stephen had to explain, um, you know, Clean Water Act regulations, et cetera. And most of the folks got that. Um, there were a few that were unsure and a tiny sliver that said they did not understand the legal requirements. But I think we did a solid job explaining that. The next two questions were, um, I would have guessed would have had the most uh, variation, and that's would the plan preserve the historic character of the site, and would the plan improve scenery? Um, in fact, we saw the same kind of response that folks think, yes, um, after the plan is in place, we will have preserved the historic character of the site because the mill will still be um, in great shape, and we will improve the scenery. Um, again, I think that's obviously a subjective question, but folks seem to think that this plan will improve scenery. Um, will the plan improve opportunities to learn about nature? We've got the Fullersburg um, Nature Center right there and opportunities for educational signage. So we had uh, strong support on that one. Um, will the plan improve public safety and water quality? Um, public safety, we we didn't have a, we had a slightly softer response on that, but still overwhelming support. Um, will the plan improve water quality and is it a good use of financial resources? We were above 90% uh, that answered yes on those. And then kind of the overall question, do you support the master plan for Salt Creek at Fullersburg Woods? And that was where we had, um, I believe it was 90 point, 86% or 91% if you round up support and about 9% opposed. And then we asked folks to rate their support for the master plan. Again, so we had 86% um, strongly support, about 4%, 4.5% were support. Um, and then opposed and strongly opposed combined for about 9% of the respondents. Um, and so in, you know, statistical work, survey work, if you're looking at public opinion and you get anything above 75, you're doing pretty good. Um, in this case, we've, you know, made a, a really good faith effort to make sure folks had a chance to weigh in. Um, and I think we can be pretty confident that the public does support this plan. Um, most of the folks who responded did take the time to kind of understand what was being proposed and what the benefits would be. Um, but even folks that were just shooting from the hip and saying that they like it or didn't like it, 
um, overall, we're getting really strong data and support. So the, the next steps on this is to take the feedback, the substantive feedback that we got um, and incorporate that into the plan as appropriate. There's not a lot of real major changes that'll be made, I think, but again, a close look at water source in this raceway that's gonna be now hydraulically disconnected from the creek and then looking at options to make the the will the mill wheel move as as feasible um, we're going to present these results to the forest preserve district uh, september 22nd meeting and we'll also share them with the public so everyone that responded can see kind of the the takeaway here and then the the next date for a vote by the forest preserve district would probably be october 6th and that would be um, approval of the master plan, which would be kind of a, a key step to, to getting things moving forward. And so that's the, the kind of rundown of our results here. And I think it was, you know, a good effort. We had a lot of groups from, you know, members and public agencies that are part of the work group that, that showed up to make explanations and sort of say their piece about why this is important and a really good turnout from everybody. So I think that um, we can be confident that this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good public engagement experience here. Um, we didn't rush anything. We took time to make sure folks had, had the full explanation, had their questions answered. So I think we're in good shape to move forward and hopefully the, the Forest Preserve District agrees. And we can do any kind of questions that folks have. So, so far I have one question and the question is responses from the municipalities. Are these from corporate authorities or responses from individuals? For example, I only saw, I saw only six responses from Oak Brook. Does that not mean only six people responded? That is six people who responded from Oak Brook. Six people who responded said their address was in Oak Brook. So that means only- um, I don't know if they were we can look and see if they were representing a group, um, but I mean, this is a public comment form, so it's an individual response. And also does this sample response size have real validity? Uh, I would say it does because this, was, this wasn't a survey, um, which is what we did in the past to just get a, a statistically significant sample. Um, this was sort of the opportunity for anyone who had concerns or opinions about the project to weigh in. So if folks were um, happier or unhappy with it, this was their chance to weigh in. And if folks didn't weigh in, um, you know, that, that sort of, that's their option. It wasn't, of course, not required. So we're not reaching out to specific communities um, to say, please answer this. We just put that that notice out um, multiple times in the Daily Herald, um, through a couple of news articles, through our email list and other outreach to make sure that folks knew this was happening. And then anyone that had opinions or comments on it, this was their opportunity to weigh in. So um, the, the couple months of lead up where there were meetings in advance, you know, everyone had the, the awareness that these meetings were coming up. And then you can you know, so as a public comment, you can make comment or not. Um, and so that's, that's the folks that, that responded. Uh, Pete, could you speak briefly just, just to that question about the earlier poll that we did that was to try to gather mm -hmm. representative? Yeah, so we did um, about a year back a, a phone poll and an online poll. So, um, and the, the telephone poll is the one we would rely on as kind of a, a statistically significant sample of what folks in DuPage County thought about the project. So that was, um, the, the exact number escapes me, but say 480 or so people, which is statistically significant to represent the population of DuPage County, um, asking them questions similar to this about um, do historic sites and do natural uh, resources and water quality, how important are those to you? And if this project were to happen and modify the dam, would that be a pro or con? Um, and so, and that one we got 
pretty similar response. I think it was in the high 80s in terms of support for dam modification. And that was with the context of dam modification would, you know, save taxpayer money and improve water quality. Um, so we, we saw, you know, we kind of expected support and got a pretty consistent numbers. Um, I, I think a, a couple percentage points higher on the actual public comment form compared to just calling people up and getting their, their take on it. So this, obviously this is for folks that, that wanted to take the time to fill out the form. Um, but overall, you know, 80 plus percent support across the online poll, the telephone poll, and um, finally this, this public comment. Um, a couple more questions. Just to clarify again, how many responses were received? Uh, 173. And then I have a question that during the public meetings, when people oppose the project, how vehement was their opposition? And do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll let, let me, I'll weigh in on it and then you, you can okay. follow up. Um, there were, you know, there were folks that asked questions. Um, we didn't, we weren't making this a forum for folks to say, I hate this or I like this. Um, we were answering questions about the project and we said for, for the opinion, you know, the real way to do it, make sure you're counted and make sure your opinion is logged officially. If we have your response written down is to use the public comment form. Um, folks did ask questions um, challenging, I think, our, our thoughts about some of the science and the data, um, which we did our best to respond to. So, Dina, does that sound accurate? I know you were on there. I mean, we were very clear in all of our written publications, like during the our verbal talks during the webinars, as well as any written communications, that the official public record was the public comment forms and that the webinars were open houses more to ask questions. It wasn't a traditional public meeting where people got two minutes to speak. It was more of a presentation with a round table for questions on various aspects of the project. And we were very, like I said, we were just very clear in all of our written things that the official public comment period form was the um, RestoreSaltCreek.org form. I have one more question, and then um, this is more, I think, for me or Stephen, and it's, will the project be publicly bid? And if so, is there an estimate date for soliciting bids and constructions? And the answer to that is that, yes, it will be publicly bid. What method it is publicly bid has not been decided at this time. Um, whether we go through one of our bidding processes through our partner organizations or if the DRSCW bids it. Um, and we're assuming that if we are, we'll kind of talk through our timetable during the actual meeting. Um, but if we get permission from the Forest Preserve to move forward on this project, we in October, we estimate 12 to 18 months for final engineering and bidding. So looking at, you know, a year to 18 months from now for that bid process to go through because we still have final engineering and permitting to do prior to preparing and preparation of bid documents before we can actually go to bidding and construction. Are there any other questions? And once again, to be clear, as Dina said, that's all contingent on the Forest Preserve approving the project moving forward. Okay. okay. Well, I have no other questions that I can see in either the Q&A or the chat. Okay. Well, Pete, then in I that case, that's thank good, you. Right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so we'll be, we'll be making this info available to everybody um, soon before the Forest Preserve meeting and moving forward to keep folks informed. Thanks, Dean and Stephen, for having me and um, have a good meeting. Thanks. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Thank you. Peter. I'll stop sharing. <laughs>